Hey, this is Julio. Hey, this is Steve. Before the podcast starts, we want to welcome and give you the opportunity to support our ministry by visiting our website at www.bridgemenlaredo.org. Scroll down to the bottom of any page and you'll find the PayPal donate button. Bridge Ministries exists to share the glorious good news of Jesus Christ and to equip people to be transformed by the renewing of their minds. If you would like to help us in our mission of making affordable or free Bibles and Christian books available and also to check out the orphanage that we support, visit our website. Welcome back to another episode of Bridge Radio, coming at you as always from the great state of Texas, proclaiming the gospel to the nations fearlessly and faithfully. I am your host as always, Julio Omad Rodriguez, and across from me, I have the theologian himself, Mr. A.W. Varela, a.k.a. Abe Varela. And you know why I'm going with A.W.? Because you keep calling me Gabe, so I just want to make sure that everybody knows that. <laughs> I thought you were going for Tozer. <laughs> no, 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 no. And then to the right of me, we have uh, the boss himself, the founder of Bridge Ministries. Hey, everybody. This is Steve Den Hartog. It's good to be with you again this day. What's, what's your theologian name? What was My yours? Theologian? I don't think I had one. No, I but the, the, the uh, is, was it S.W.? S.W. S- well, S.J. S.J. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> That's our joke around here, guys, for those who are new listeners. But yes, yeah, so we're excited today about today's episode. I've been waiting for about a month or two to get to this day uh, for two reasons. One, because it's the series of the Doctrines of Grace. I am absolutely in love with these beautiful truths uh, that are found right. upon the scriptures. And uh, not only that, but um, we also have a lineup of guests, uh, one of them today. It's going to be such an honor and privilege to have him on uh, Bridge Radio for the first time. He's a blessing to the church, a sharp mind, and somebody who's had uh, a big influence uh, on my theology, on Steve's theology, on on uh, Abe's theology, and, and uh, we've actually been reading together his systematic theology. So we'll probably talk a little bit about that here, but um, I have two announcements before we dive in. Uh, if you're listening and you're a listener through iTunes, um, hey, write a, uh, give us a five-star review. Write some nice things about us, what you like, and you'll have the opportunity to win a bridge travel mug to keep your beverage rather cold or hot, whether it's tea or coffee. Um, they're great, built like a tank. And second, just want to let all you guys know that we have Bridge Ministries' first conference ever, and it's going to be on apologetics, defending the faith, May 26th of this year at Tammy U, Texas A&M International University. Uh, if you want to find out more information on that, um, you could visit our Facebook page at Bridge uh, uh, Bridge Ministries of Laredo or visit our website at www.bridgebookstexas.org and uh, you can find more information on that there. So, all right, are we ready? Are we ready, ready, Steve? Let's do it. Let's do it. Ready, Abe? A-W? A-W. All right, so the Doctrines of Grace... Today is the first of the series. And so what is the doctrines of grace? What are they? And so the doctrines of grace are a comprehensive description and explanation of the sovereignty of God and salvation taught in the acronym TULIP. So the T stands for total depravity. The U stands for unconditional election. The L stands for limited atonement. The I stands for irresistible grace. And the P stands for perseverance of the saints. And our reason for doing this as a ministry, um, our prayer and purpose for doing this series is to match magnify ultimately the glorious grace of God in salvation. And we hope through the series, God not only grants understanding to the beautiful truths of each doctrine, but also opens the eyes of the lost. And so it's quite interesting, guys, uh, for the new listeners and us, uh, we're actually not beginning our first uh, episode of the series on one of the doctrines of grace, but with a conversation and the teaching of the sovereignty of God. And as for why we're beginning the series on the sovereignty of God, well, I'll leave it for our guests to explain. So let's introduce. You ready, Abe? I'm ready. ready. All right. So our guest began his teaching career on the faculty of Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia before serving as a founding faculty member at Westminster Seminary, California for more than 20 years. He is best known for his prolific writings, particularly 
his four-volume Theology of Lordship series, the second volume in the series, The Doctrine of God, won the 2003 Gold Medallion Award from the Evangelical Christian Publishers Association in the category of Theology and Doctrine. He's an ordained minister in the Presbyterian Church in America who is deeply committed to the work of ministry and to training pastors. He is also the author of many books, a lot of them that we have here at Bridge Ministries that you could pick up, uh, some of them such as Apologetics, A Justification of Christian Belief, Christian Ethics, The Doctrine of the Word of God, The Doctrine of the Christian Life, and like I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, uh, our favorite systematic theology, which is his, Systematic Theology and Introduction to the Christian Belief. But hold on, Abe. I'm not done, man. I'm not done. (laughs) So uh, uh, he's, he's earned a Bachelor's of Arts from Princeton, a Bachelor's of Divinity from Westminster Theological Seminary, a Master's of Philosophy from Yale, and lastly, his Doctorates of Divinity from Belhaven University. It's an honor and privilege to welcome to Bridge Radio, Dr. John Frame. Welcome onto the program. Wonderful to be with you, Julio, and with your listeners. Thank you. Thank you for coming on. Yeah, so you're, uh, uh, you, you read a little bit, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was surrounded by books. I'm sitting in my <laughs> office here, and uh, I could uh, read books for the next uh, hundred years. I think we were just talking yesterday about what your what your library must look like. Yeah, we were talking about that. And I and I well, and I th- I'm in the mode of giving them away right now. But uh, oh, at one really? time, uh, I, they were in the, the thousands and so on. Wow. Well. That's great. We're uh we're we take donations here at Bridge Ministries, so we would. I'm sure Steve will take it off your hands, uh, Dr. Frame. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. so we can yeah. make arrangements. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, Dr. Frame. So, like I said at the at the beginning of the program, we're we're beginning our series on the doctrines uh, of grace, and particularly, we're going to be starting off on the sovereignty of God. And so, I wanted to dive in on this subject, and I know Steve has our first question for you. Yeah, so Dr. Frame, um, one of the, uh, obviously one of the themes that, uh, the main theme that runs throughout Scripture is God's lordship or sovereignty. You mentioned in your systematic theology that that term Lord is used over some 7,000 times. And so uh, it's a central theme, obviously, of Scripture and of your systematic theology. So I was just wondering if you could give us a definition of divine lordship or sovereignty. When we're talking about God's sovereignty, what what are we talking about? Well, God's lordship uh, is, uh, it represents everything that God is in relation to us. When God makes something other than himself, and of course, uh, uh, he himself is eternal, and uh, uh, he himself uh, 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 is unlike anything else that uh, we're acquainted with. Mm -hmm. He's uh, the creator and we are the creatures. Mm -hmm. And so his relationship to the things that he's made, his relationship to the creation is called lordship. Mm -hmm. And uh, I uh, analyze that in my various books uh, as including three concepts especially. Mm. Uh, one is his control. He's in control of everything that he he's made. He works all things after the counsel of his own will, mm-hmm. uh, Ephesians 1.11. Uh, so he's in control. The second concept is that he's in authority. That means when he speaks, uh, everything else is expected to obey, uh-huh. and uh, he has the right to tell us what to do. So he says in the Ten Commandments, uh, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. So uh, he says, I am the Lord, and therefore you obey these commands. So we have control, we have authority, and then the third lordship attribute, as I call it, Mm -hmm. is his presence. That is to say, when God uh, commits himself uh, to uh, a created person or created thing or family or a group of created persons, uh, he uh, comes to be with them. Over and over again in Scripture, God promises his people, I will be with you. 
and we remember that uh, uh, from Jesus, who is called Emmanuel, who is God with us. Mm -hmm. So an important part of lordship is that the Lord is with his people. He's committed to his people. He's uh, near his Mm. people when they call upon him. So I distinguish within the concept of lordship, those three concepts, control, authority, and presence. Okay, good. And you you use some different terminology, I think, once in a while as well, like uh, the ethics book specifically, I think you have them termed as normative, situational, and existential, but they would all refer to those same three things. Is that correct? That's right. Well, I begin, of course, by describing God's lordship, and then I talk about how uh, those lordship attributes apply to us. Sure. And when we talk about God's uh, control, uh, that has to do with uh, the way he structures every situation in the world that he's made. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we're uh, walking through our lifetimes uh, uh, with uh, various, uh, facing various situations on every side under the control of God, I call that the situational perspective as we're trying to understand our environment. And, uh, but of course, uh, as we travel through history, as we travel through our situation, uh, we are looking to please God. We're looking to hear his word. Uh, we're looking to obey his authority Mm -hmm. and, uh, his authority is expressed to us by commands or what I call norms. Mm -hmm. So I call that the normative perspective, trying Mm -hmm. to find what uh, God's, uh, how to apply God's commands in every situation. That's the Mm -hmm. normative perspective. And then uh, when we look for, for God's personal presence with each one of us, uh, God uh, leading each person uh, in uh, through his life, uh, God uh, entering into intimate relationships uh, with our hearts and souls. Uh, that, of course, is uh, God's lordship attribute of personal presence, and I call that the existential perspective. So we have the uh, three perspectives normative, situational, and existential. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Thank you. All right. All right, Dr. Fram. Good stuff. Um, So I wanted you to speak on why do you think divine lordship is central to our understanding of God? Well, that's just the way God has made the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, God has made the world so that uh, he can exercise his lordship. So every place we turn, uh, uh, there is God exercising his lordship. I'm Mm -hmm. looking out the window of my office now, and I see the wind blowing branches of the trees around. Mm -hmm. All of that is God's power, God's control, Mm -hmm. God making things happen. And, uh, of course, through the natural world, uh, God reveals his majesty. He reveals his power and so uh God's world is a uh, uh, is a revelation of him and that's mm-hmm. uh, normative and then I know that God is near when I see those uh, branches blowing around because they couldn't work unless uh, God were there so I think of that as uh, as God's presence so every place that I go mm. uh I run into God's uh, lordship and everything in the Bible uh, describes God's lordship, his creation, his giving of the law, uh, his uh, choosing Israel from all the nations mm-hmm. of the world, uh, his providence with them, his giving them victory over their enemies, mm-hmm. and of course, sending his son, uh, Jesus Christ. So all of that is uh an exercise of God's lordship. And everything I learn in the Bible, uh, I'm learning more and more of what it means for him to be the Lord. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's the 
that's the beauty of uh, of God's sovereignty. And so, how how does divine lordship impact our understanding of the doctrines of grace? Well, because God is the one who controls all things, mm-hmm. then certainly uh, He controls all the aspects of our salvation. Yeah. Salvation is not something that we can work up. It's not uh, something that we can do for ourselves. We can't. Uh, earn our salvation from sin, because Mm -hmm. if we're guilty sinners, there's no way that we can make up for that by seeking to do good works. Mm -hmm. And so we can only trust uh, that God will do everything on our behalf, and that's called grace, that Mm -hmm. God uh, is the one who chooses us before the foundation of the world. God is the one who sent his Son Uh, to save us by dying on the cross and Mm -hmm. rising again. And God is the one who sends his spirit uh, to change our hearts, to give us new birth, and to uh, give us uh, uh, new nature so that we can uh, serve him uh, uh, rather than rebelling against him. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I, kind of what you were saying, the, the doctrines of grace, well, I mean, when it comes to the sovereignty of God, um, we've heard Dr. James White say that, um, as, as we talked about the, the acrostic tulip, that there needs to be an S at the beginning to spell tulip. Mm. And, 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 and the reason why, I, this is why we're starting off with the sovereignty of God first, and I kind of want you to speak on this, is because I think, I think what people have when they start coming to the doctrines of grace, um, they have an issue with God's absolute sovereignty. And I kind of wanted you to, to kind of speak on that, what Dr. James White said, if you would, if you would agree with that, I'm, I'm more than sure. Uh, but the, the, the God's sovereignty is sort of an, uh, what is an undergirding of the doctrines of grace. Would, would you say that in, in order for us to yeah, get a proper well, understanding? Yes. Well, it's because God is sovereign that uh, mm-hmm. uh, we are saved by grace in mm-hmm. every aspect of salvation. Mm-hmm. Our uh, uh, righteousness comes by grace. Our holiness mm. comes by grace. Uh, our obedience comes by grace. Uh, everything that we do comes by grace because, mm. of course, uh, God is the one who rules over the whole process. Uh, yeah. He is sovereign. And so, so uh, salvation by grace is one part of divine sovereignty. As yes. I said, uh, God's sovereignty extends over all the universe, over everything that he's made, every motion that takes place uh, on any planet, on any star, in any part of the earth. Uh, that comes about because of God's uh, will. Yeah. And uh, God's will, therefore, extends to everything. Well, human salvation is part of that. Mm-hmm. And so if God's will is what controls absolutely everything that happens, then, of course, uh, uh, God's will is what controls our uh, salvation. Yeah. And, Dr. Frame, uh, in light of that, can you speak on the tension that exists between divine sovereignty and free will? Yes. Well, uh, uh, free will is, of course, something that needs to be defined. Mm-hmm. Uh, People have different ideas as to what free will is. Now, generally speaking, uh, when I say that I have free will, what I mean is that I I could do this or I could do the opposite. I can choose between uh, doing one thing and doing something else. Uh, And uh, so uh, that uh, pertains to most everything that I do uh, Mm -hmm. in this life. But, of course, lying behind that are all of the things in the natural world that influence my decisions. Uh, I'm not free to uh, uh, jump eight feet if I don't have any legs. And so uh, the uh, affairs of this life, the way I'm born, the Mm -hmm. kind of uh, abilities I have, the kinds of disabilities I have, uh, those uh, constrain my free will so that I can't just choose anything that I want to do. Mm-hmm. And even behind that, behind those natural causes, uh, lies the plan of God. Mm-hmm. And uh, 
So it's God who uh, ultimately wills uh, what choices are available to me. Yeah. And uh, it's God who limits what I can choose to do and what I can't choose to do. And so, uh, therefore, uh, the sovereignty of God is uh, more fundamental uh, than my uh, free choice. So is it fair to say it would be limited free will? <laughs> Uh, well, sure. It's, uh, <laughs> uh, it depends on uh, what words you want to use. In one sense, it's not free at all, but uh, yeah, yeah. there there are uh, senses in which, uh, for example, I, I, I'm free from from uh, uh, certain uh, constraints. I'm sitting in my office right now. Mm -hmm. I don't have a seatbelt around me, yeah. so uh, <laughs> I'm not constrained by the seatbelt. I can get up and walk to the right or I can walk to the left and uh, uh, there's there there's no uh, uh, nothing forcing me to sit in the chair uh, but on the other hand uh, there are lots of natural laws there are lots of things going on in my body mm -hmm. and uh, behind all those things there's the plan of God so uh, yeah. uh, and I can't contravene that so mm -hmm. uh, there are limitations to what I can uh, choose, and uh, the ultimate limitation is God's decision. Yes, and uh, another question that I definitely wanted to ask is, um, you know, in, in regards to Arminian thought, which is, I think we would all agree here, is the more predominant um, sort of theology that people hold here in America, and uh, I was speaking with somebody who I dearly love, and, and I was sort of going through with them the doctrines of grace, and we were sort of going back and forth on, you know, does God choose you or, or you choose God, and a different, definitely different perspectives of, of God's sovereignty. And, uh, you know, as for those who don't know who, what Arminianism is, um, they believe that well, we choose God, we have the choice, while as us who hold to reform theology, all four of us here, would believe that God chooses you. Um, and so as I was going back and forth with this individual, they said, you know, well, it kind of seems unfair, you know, that, that God, um, you know, has to open our eyes. Like, it is, isn't there some sort of beauty in that we would choose God? Like, I, I feel, and this is the individual was telling me, was like, I feel like God wants us to choose us. He gives us that choice, that open choice, and, and I feel like it's unfair. Um, to that individual, Dr. Frame, what, what would you say? Well, uh, as I said a moment ago, we do make choices, mm -hmm. and uh, God, of course, wants us to make choices. Uh, he wants us to make the right choices. Uh, he said, uh, you know, how Joshua said to the people of Israel, choose you this day whom you will serve. Uh -huh. But as for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. So in that context, uh, Joshua says, I want you to make a choice. You have to make a decision as to whether you're going to serve God or not. Uh -huh. And each human being has that decision to uh, uh, to make. Uh, we're, we're called upon to uh, uh, follow Jesus or, or not to follow Jesus, however uh, that goes. But of course, uh, uh, behind that, as I said, there's the mysterious plan of God operating, and uh, uh, I, I don't understand how that works. But mm. uh, uh, Paul says that uh, God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, and that's yeah. going back to eternity. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the, the Bible uh, uh, does tell us that God's choice lies behind uh, our choices. Now, that doesn't mm -hmm. mean that we have no choice to make. If uh, yeah. you come to know Christ, uh, uh, you you must choose to come to know Christ. You must choose to obey Him. You must mm -hmm. choose to serve Him. And uh, that's an obligation. And uh, just as God uh, uh, wants us to keep all of our other obligations, don't murder, don't steal, don't mm. commit adultery, uh, God wants us to make all those choices. So He wants us to make the choice to serve Him. But uh, in the final analysis, uh, He's the one, He's the Lord, and that means. Uh, in part that he controls what choices people make. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's certainly a tension there that's sometimes difficult for us to, uh, well, we can't fully comprehend it, obviously, but uh, 
the Bible reveals it to us, and so it's one of those things I think that we just have to uh, we have to let God um, resolve and uh, just trust Him um, to carry out His will as He sees fit. That's right. With regards to God's sovereignty, I think um, sometimes it it can almost be seem like a a threat sometimes to some people. But why should God's sovereignty be actually a comfort to us? How how is it that having that understanding of God um, and his lordship in our lives, how is that a comfort for us? Well, I, again, I keep turning us back to the Bible here. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's so many passages of the Bible in which uh, uh, God's sovereignty is a comfort. The one that uh, I always go back to is uh, Romans uh, uh, chapter 8. Mm-hmm. Uh, here I am turning to it here, and uh, Paul, of course, is writing. Uh, he's the apostle, and he's undergone a lot of uh, difficult things, but uh, uh, he says about these difficulties, uh, what shall we say to these things? This is verse 31 mm. of chapter 8. Mm-hmm. If God is for us, who can be against us? Mm, yeah. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not with him graciously give us all things. Mm. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Mm. Who is he who condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that who was raised, Mm. who is at the right hand of God, who is interceding for us. Mm. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine? You see how Paul just goes through all of these things that, that bother us, uh, all these things that trouble us mm. and give us pain and uh, give us distress. And he says uh, uh, we have this assurance that uh, none of these things can separate us from the love of God because God is the one who keeps us uh, fixed Mm -hmm. uh, together with him. He is always God with us. Mm -hmm. He's uh, always using his all-powerful control uh, to keep us uh, by his side and to keep us within his covenant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very good. I I remember reading about uh, A.W. Tozer once, I think he said that uh, a proper understanding of God spares us from 10,000 temporal problems. And I think that's, you know, it's so (laughs) true that uh, when we rest in, when we learn to rest in him and his sovereignty, it spares us from so many things that would otherwise torment us. Oh, yes, that's absolutely true. Yeah. Um, go, going back to one thing that you said in, 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 in the previous question that Steve answered, you, you, you said that I, you know, I keep going back to Scripture, I keep going back to Scripture again. And I think that this is very important for, for Christians to understand is, is to have a, a biblical view mm. of God's sovereignty and not a view that is merely founded upon uh, mere opinion or, or you know, man's philosophy, mm. uh, but uh, based upon the Scriptures. And I, I definitely would like for you, Dr. Frame, to talk about the absolute sovereignty of God. Maybe point to some Scriptures for our listeners um, that could get—we talked a little bit about them, that you know, God's even in control of, of nature, of, of the wind and the, the leaves, and you looking outside of your office. And I, you know, I think this could possibly be new for some Christians to, 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 to think about. Um, but again, going back to the Scriptures, uh, can, can you talk about God's absolute uh, sovereignty in, 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 in some um, scriptures uh, that point to that? Well, uh, of course, uh, scripture begins by saying, in the beginning, God created hmm. the heavens and the earth. And so that means that God is behind absolutely everything. Now, the, uh, the heavens and the earth include everything apart from God himself. Mm-hmm. So everything... Uh, uh, apart from God, that God made uh, is created by Him, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, how is it created? Well, it's created by uh, His speaking. He says, "Let there be light," and there is light. He says, "Let the uh, uh, the the night be separated from the morning," and every and those things are separated. And He says, "Let the dry land appear," and the dry land appears. So he speaks, and uh, everything happens that happens. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, the implication, you get this through the Psalms, Mm -hmm. too, about how 
uh, God speaks and things happen. The voice of the Lord uh, breaks down the big cedar trees and, yeah. and uh, all of that. Uh, so uh, God is just uh, in control of the whole world, mm. the whole universe. Everything that uh, uh, is in the universe is under his control because he made it, yeah. uh, because he is the Lord over it. Mm, yeah. And uh, so uh, we are just part of that. We've, we've got to recognize right. that uh, we are really a very small part of the uh, universe that God has made, and uh, therefore, you know, if God is able to uh, control all the stars with all the billions of light years mm. of distance and yeah. uh, right. uh, all of the matter and, and uh, energy and motion and all of that, but the, it's really a very small thing in a way for God to control uh, our own lives and to keep us uh, uh, from the dangers of uh, uh, life uh, and to keep us close, uh, bound uh, under His fatherly care. Mm, amen. Mm-hmm. Yes. And, and and Doctor, you know, one of the verses you, you know you were just uh, reciting in Romans eight. Um, I mean, I think one of the verses in Romans eight twenty eight that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love Him, to those who are called according to His purpose. I mean, absolutely. We read that and. I mean, I just find so much comfort in that yeah. verse. Amen. Yeah. And, yeah. And in his sovereignty. And then, uh, and then you go on to uh, Romans 11, uh, 36, mm-hmm. uh, for from him and through him mm-hmm. and to him are all things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. To him be glory forever. Amen. So that's uh, all inclusive. Everything mm-hmm. that there is is uh, from him and through him and, and to him. Amen. Yes. Yes, yes. Would you consider yourself more of a compatibilist uh, in, in, in regards to the, the tension between God's divine sovereignty and free will? Uh, yes, I, okay. I, I'm a compatibilist. That is to say, I think that uh, uh, human beings are free in the way that I described earlier, mm-hmm. but that freedom does not exclude uh, God's uh, sovereign control. Okay. All right, all right. Um, yeah, I, when us too, we would we would definitely say we're compatibilists. And so, we, and so, I have um, you know one view of of God's sovereignty is open theism. Um, could you talk about what one what open theism is, and also why isn't it accurate to the biblical description of of God's sovereignty? Well, open theists. Uh are are usually people who come out of an Arminian background. Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh, <clears throat> in Arminianism, of course, uh, uh, Arminians try to make room for uh, uh, a stronger concept of human freedom, mm-hmm. uh, human freedom without divine control, human freedom. And uh, the, one of the big problems in Arminianism is that uh, uh, most Arminians believe that even though God doesn't control everything, God doesn't control our free choices, nevertheless, he knows them in advance. Uh, so that when God uh, created the world, he knew in advance mm-hmm. that uh, Adam would fall. and He knew in advance mm-hmm. that uh, uh, John Frame would be a theology mm-hmm. teacher and so on <laughs> and so forth. Right. So... Uh, uh, Arminians, uh, traditional Arminians, historical Arminians, believe that uh, although human beings have uh, uh, free choice and that uh, God doesn't interfere with that, nevertheless, uh, God knows everything we're going to do in advance. Right. Now, open theists look at that, and they said, how can that be <laughs> if God knows uh, what I'm going to do, how can I be free not to do it? Mm-hmm. So uh, if God knew, uh, say, back, forget about eternity past, let's go back to 1930. <laughs> if God knew in 1930 that I'd be sitting at this desk, uh, then it wouldn't be possible for me to sit anywhere else. Right. I, I wouldn't yeah. have the freedom to sit anywhere else. Huh. So uh, the open theist really takes a, a major step 
away from the Bible, I would say, uh, what the open theist says is God doesn't even know in advance what his creatures will do. Uh Uh, God cannot predict what his creatures will freely choose to do. Uh So uh, God does not know Uh in 1930 that I will be sitting in my office chair. Uh, That depends on my free choice, Mm -hmm. and that uh, depends upon lots of other free choices, too. It depends on the free choices of uh, RTS to even give me an office here in their building (laughs) and uh, so on. So uh, there's so many things that happen uh, because of free choice. Uh, There are very few things that God even knows. Mm -hmm. So in open theism, you have... uh, uh, you have a very ignorant God. Uh, yeah. God knows, uh, God has such a hard time knowing things because he cannot predict uh, what decisions people will make on the basis of their free will. Yeah. Now, I think that's completely unbiblical. I think mm-hmm. what the Bible teaches is that God knows the end from the beginning. Uh, what the Bible teaches is that uh, uh, God is able to prophesy thousands and thousands of years before events take place, what exactly is going to happen. Uh, uh, God inspires his prophets to uh, uh, predict the coming of Jesus, even yeah. though uh, many things happen during that period that depend on uh, human uh, free choices. So yes. uh, I, I think that open theism, uh, I've written a book on it, by the way, it's mm-hmm. called uh, No Other God. Hmm. I think that open theism is uh, really very far uh, removed from Scripture. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah, yeah. Good stuff, Dr. Frame. All right. So um, for our listeners, if you're new or you've been listening, um, Dr. Frame, can you share the gospel with our listeners? Well, the gospel can be presented on uh, a lot of different uh uh, at a lot of different levels, uh, but I I just prefer to do it very simply, and then if people have additional questions, they can ask. But uh, the gospel says that uh, human beings have committed sin against a holy God. We have all uh, we have all disobeyed Him, and therefore we deserve His eternal punishment. But. <coughs> Our God uh, loves us so much that he sent his only begotten son, Mm. uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, to be born of a virgin, to uh, live on this earth, to teach, to work miracles. Mm. And uh, Jesus was crucified, even though he was the best man that ever lived, he was crucified uh, and uh, when he was crucified, he was dying not for his own sins, not because he deserved to die. Mm-hmm. He was dying because uh, uh, he was taking all of our sins upon himself. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was dying in our place. Uh, he is our substitute. And so he bears the penalty uh, for sin before uh, God. And the fact that he was raised from the dead after he died showed that God accepted his sacrifice. Mm-hmm. And if we are to be receive forgiveness from God, it's uh, absolutely important that we believe in Jesus, that we trust in him. Mm-hmm. And so John 3.16 says it all. Mm-hmm. God Uh, so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks a lot, Dr. Frame, for uh, um, just that all the information was great. Um, As we we wind down here and land the plane, uh, what are some books that you would recommend on the sovereignty of God? Um, Your best recommendation, top books, (laughs) <laughs> Including your own. Well, yeah. I've written yeah. a few of them myself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> written all these books on lordship, so you might look them over. Uh, my fr- uh, friend and uh, colleague, Vern Poitras uh, mm-hmm. of Westminster in Philadelphia, we have worked together for many years, and he also wrote a very good book uh, called The Lordship of Christ. 
And, uh, of course, there are a lot of classical books that deal with the sovereignty of God. There's uh, uh, the book by Lorraine Bettner called The Reformed Doctrine of Predestination. Uh, there's uh, the book by uh, Steele and Thomas, uh, mm-hmm. uh, The Five Points of Calvinism, uh, uh, Illustrated, Applied, and Defended. I think I forget all that uh, title, but uh, <laughs> that was one that we were all reading when I was growing up. Uh-huh. And uh, so uh, uh, there's there's a vast literature, really, uh, in the uh, Reformed theology, Calvinistic theology. One way to get a very good grip on the sovereignty of God is by uh, reading uh, John Calvin's Institutes mm-hmm. of the Christian Religion. It's yep. on every page there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, Martin Luther's uh, Bondage of the Will yep. is a very powerful book uh, uh, relating uh, uh, free will to uh, God's uh, sovereignty. So yeah. I'd certainly urge that uh, people would read that whenever they get a chance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Frame, for coming on Bridge Radio. Um, We would definitely love to have you back again to talk on another uh, topic, another subject, maybe possibly another series. Absolutely, yeah. Um, All right, guys, well, that's going to go ahead and wrap up uh, episode number one of six. So on the Doctrines of Grace, um, stay tuned for next week as we start on Total Depravity with Jeff Durbin. And uh, it's going to be another good one, good conversation, and we're going to unpack total depravity. So as always, guys, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. And we'll see you next week. Yeah, bye.